Hello, Endeavor here. So tonight I'm speaking with Orwell from the Twitter account and YouTube channel Orwell and Good. You probably know him from Twitter. He has a great Twitter account with many followers. One of the best slam dunkers on Twitter with uh, all these uh, hilarious, uh, you know, posts about these crazy takes from uh, from the leftists and you know these ridiculous mainstream media articles. But he actually is a pretty articulate guy, and he is actually very interested in. Uh, right-wing politics and the various things I talk about on my channel. So I'll let him introduce himself. How are you doing tonight, Orwell? I'm good, thank you, Endeavor. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Yeah, um, I mainly just started out as a sort of a meme account on Twitter to kind of give myself a platform to shill my libertarian blogging back in the day. But of course, I think as most people since 2015 have shifted away from libertarianism. And now I'm pretty much ideolo ideologically homeless, but I am on the right, the sort of dissident right faction. And I just wrote a book on time preferences because that's something that, was, that really interested me back when I was in that kind of scenery. But it's you almost usually just relegated to a, a, a solely economic or materialistic realm. And I think in my book, I kind of add that sort of a more metaphysical dimension to the whole prospect of viewing time and, the, and you know, going forward and how people sort of value things and... Um, uh, the book is um, a lot of it is a critique of modern consumerism and the fact that you know a lot of the problems that we face today are, is the, the 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 narrative stranglehold that the media, the academia, and that the entertainment industry has on modern society, and they are really reaching warp speed. You know, with pe people like Netflix sort of championing the uh, being against the Georgia abortion bill, that's one example, and then promotion of the animated series Big Mouth, which verged, verges on pretty degenerate territory, and stuff like the, the Sabrina remake, which I believe had a teen orgy in it as well. So my question is, how do you go forward? How do you get people to be more future-oriented rather than sort of cutting them off at the, at, uh, at the roots, which is what's been happening ever since the civil rights era? And I, I just take what was an economic theory, which is heavily talked about in sort of ANCAP circles, and I kind of expound it to fit a broader spectrum, make, make it more sort of palatable to wider society and easier to understand, rather than it being confined to sort of some very esoteric right-wing groups. Yeah, because time preference is something I've talked about quite a bit on my channel, and that uh, one of the major problems I see with the modern West is really the lack of time preference, and that there doesn't really seem to be this grand plan for the future. Like, I don't really see where uh, our societies are going. Well, I mean, I do see that there is a grand plan for the future, but it's obviously a very um, nefarious one and one that we don't, mm. we certainly don't want to come true. But in, in terms of like the average person and even the average like politician, the average leader, the average voice of authority, they have no vision for the future. It's all just uh, seems like the here and now and how can we, you know, gratify ourselves as much as possible in the here and now. And it's a really destructive uh, way of looking at the world because it just justifies, like you had said, uh, consumerism really. It just justifies uh, these actions that may gratify you in the present, but in the long term, in terms of actually running a long lasting civilization, they really don't work. So like, what, what would be some of the things in your book that you identify as uh, being indicators of very bad time preference oh uh, consumerism sexual liberalization recreational drug use alcoholism living paycheck to paycheck of course some of these things are unavoidable such as living paycheck to paycheck there are sort of these extenuating um, economic factors which have led to this situation and and sort of some social ones too such as mass immigration in america and i kind of use america as an example of this and europe is also a pretty good example of how to um, how, how since the 50s the workforce has practically doubled because the population has doubled and, and if not it's more than doubled because since sort of sexual liberation and the women's liberation movement the workforce has also increased massively and a lot of the job roles taken up by women in order to so you know give them seeming empowerment has, have been pretty economically unproductive roles such as HR compliance bureaucracy uh, etc um, and one of the things you talk about a lot in your videos is order so in order for people to have low time preferences there needs to be an a priori assumption that there is going to be order in the future um long-term 
investments sort of carry a greater risk factor because the possibilities of things happening in between here and the future gratification that you wish to receive there's many more things that could go wrong in that time frame and and now that we have so many conflicting narratives meta narratives and so much is happening in the news cycles we're living in some very politically unstable times as well in the west with this sort of of, uh, well, the, the, the dichotomy today is, is obviously nationalism versus globalism and a, a sort of a nationalism which has been very censored and uh, very vilified by the press. But you need for there to be more order in order to be, for people to be more long-term oriented. When there's so much change, be it sort of social, demographic, economic, and political, it's very difficult to live beyond the here and now it's very difficult to make accurate judgments as to how to uh, even if it's just economic decision making or family planning or just living somewhere with with an implied level of stability even places in middle america are being you know rearranged through mass immigration from places like mexico and the rest of central america and in europe the countryside you know as you can tell i'm i'm originally british but I live in South America now, but um, in Britain, you have many rural towns and cities in the north of Britain, which were deindustrialized since uh, sort of since the beginning of the 20th century as uh, globalism started to take root, sort of economic globalism started to take root. And now the deindustrialized areas have been introduced, have had several migrants from places like Pakistan, Bangladesh, India introduced into the neighborhoods, of course. Um, what do you what do you expect is going to happen? So it's 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 there by design to instill chaos. Because if you're living in a chaotic environment, there's more of a propensity to live for the moment, this sort of live fast, die young mentality. And um, the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention was, and this might be controversial because, you know, I, I know a lot of people on the right are still atheistic. A lot of them came from atheism plus and then gradually evolved through Gamergate and then libertarianism and then to Bernie Sanders, Trump, and to the position we've got now. So a lot of people might be atheistic. But um, the, now this point is just almost taken from Dostoevsky. It's like the removal of the idea of eternal life, that significantly shortens your time horizons so your time preferences are going to be limited if you don't have children or if you don't have a going concern in in the semblance of a nation they're going to be limited to when you croak um to put it bluntly so there needs to be sort of an incentive structure promoting people to think beyond the length of their nose which have all been removed in western countries and the ones that still remain sort of religiosity nation and even children now, because you see multiple articles condemning people for having too many children because it negatively affects the environment, it's immoral, it's unethical to have children when there's so much suffering in Africa or whatnot. So you saw the, these, the, the Guardian one from recently, didn't you? Uh, which one was that? There's so many from the, oh, the, the, uh, the, 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 stu the happiness expert, uh, yeah. uh, says that it says that uh, <laughs> childless unmarried women are the happiest people in society. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it, it's absolutely ridiculous, though. It's 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 ridiculous that every single ostensible incentive which makes you want to lower your time preferences beyond sort of immediate gratification have been removed. All of them, almost absolutely all of them. And and if you do want to defer gratification, you're kind of portrayed as a square by the entertainment industry. You see, like the Family Man with their backwards customs, upholding all of these um, debunked traditions. And sort of living with the kids who are noisy, they're smelly, they grow up to hate you anyway. And then the the, the wife is all woke and empowered. She she has a corporate job and rakes in ten times more than the useless husband. You see these narratives all the time. You're just imbibing just sheer toxic from um, the the, um, the the entertainment industry, and then the media puts out narratives too, which they have to try to uphold through sort of smoke and mirrors and distraction diversion tactics. And and this is sort of leading to this very spiritual rot. And I, I kind of, I, I you know, it, it's not the most riveting subjects unless you've gone through sort of a libertarian or NRX background. But I, I try to add in some sort of ontology to it, it on the subject of how there's this sort of generational disconnect between like the boomers, the silent generation, uh, Gen Y and uh, Gen X and millennials. 
So you have this sort of disconnection through this sustained vilification of Western past. You know, kids go to school at the age of four or five, and then they're there until like 21, 22, 23 sometimes. And all they receive is this unopposed garbage condemning them for what their forebears did. And it's not even the majority of their forebears. The majority of their forebears played a very insignificant role in history. But just because a few people did bad things, they all have to collectively suffer and collectively feel guilty for things that are out of their power. So this kind of leads people to be disconnected. They kind of they kind of become a blank slate. And when being a blank blank slate, they can sort of be molded into accepting any narrative that's rammed down their throat. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, that was quite a lot. <laughs> sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Actually, I have a lot to say about that. In that, I, I think, like first of all, when you see a lot of the uh, policies and a lot of the agendas pushed today, uh, like for example, like let's take abortion for example, or um, you know the LGBT agenda or uh, feminism or all these things, uh, they don't really make sense when you have a conception of of society existing beyond, you know, well, not even your own lifetime, like the, like the next 20 years, because, uh, you know, the longer, uh, the longer, uh, uh, you, your, your frame of reference, the bigger frame of reference you have, the more right wing you're going to become, because uh, like, if we take abortion as the example, uh, the debates really like uh, centered around, is it amoral to, uh, end the ch uh, child's life or well, or, or to uh, a fetus? To abort a fetus or is it a violation of a woman's rights to you know not allow her to do that uh and you know I, what was my uh what made me come down on the the side of being more towards the pro-life side is that um i just thought of the numbers of people of people who had been aborted over the last 50 years and really what uh, effect that would really would have had long term in that um, for example, I'm, I'm from Canada. I believe that the number since in the last 50 years has been around six million abortions in Canada. I, I don't know if that's right. I know it's in the I know it's in the millions, but I, I don't think it's over 10 million. Uh, I believe it was six million. But I just thought that, um, like you know, th that's almost like an entire generation of people just uh, gone, and your your time preference is way shorter when you really just have the ability to just cancel that and to, to really take no responsibility for that uh, whatsoever. And uh, like another example for uh, is like, the, and it ties in with that is fer fertility rate. Like for mm. example, if a, uh, if a society had a 1.4 fertility rate prior to the 20th, prior to the 20th century, that pretty would pretty much be a death sentence. Like uh, in the 19th century, if that had been, if it had been that low, I mean, that would have been essentially uh, the end of that nation or the end of that uh, civilization as they know it, because the next generation would be significantly smaller and far less capable of maintaining that, um, in, of maintaining it really. And when you look at it like this, you do kind of get the sense that you need to have this uh, sense of order to really have a civilization that lasts beyond. Uh, beyond, you know, the uh, our own lifetime. So, like, and the other example would be like the LGBT agenda that it, it really results in people not being able to reproduce, and you know, with this awful stuff that they're doing now with, uh, you know, transgenderism for children, the drag drag queen story time, and the them pu putting children on puberty blockers. I mean, it, it essentially removes that person's. Uh, you know, entire ability to have any kind of long-term uh, time preference because right away from birth, early in their life, their ability to both reproduce and to actually, you know, engage in a uh, healthy uh, relationship is pretty much cut off, quite literally. Uh, and and yeah, I mean, it's just like there's no um, there's no consideration for the future really because. Um, all this stuff is really just justified in uh, in our well by the liberal uh, conception of humanity that everyone is just this debased individual with no connection to a wider society and that you know they uh, the the highest good is the their ability to just essentially engage in their own appetites in that very moment and that this conception of man has really not allowed us to see ourselves as a as something bigger and 
that's, I think, a lot of the problem we're facing in, in the West is that there is no like uh, mechanisms that really guide us towards a healthier lifestyle that would bring us into the future. And you had mentioned religion, and I've been watching some videos by uh, Dr. Edward Dutton. He's mm. a relatively new channel, but he's a very he does very interesting work. And one thing he pointed out was how uh, important religion really was for civilizations in terms of uh, longevity, because they directed people towards actions that would maintain that group in a healthy uh, social um, a, a healthy social structure into the future. For example, Christianity taught about you know the uh, life after death that you know man would be judged uh, in his afterlife based on how he how he lived his life in the physical world, and that really that idea that you know you're part of something and that you know your um, existence has purpose that makes pe people aren't going to turn towards uh, th things like hedonism quite so easily if they have that if they have that in their mind and you know whether you're religious or not having kind of that uh, it as a software in your mind to really direct you towards uh, healthy civilizational actions is a positive and I think that the West is really lacking something without that and it's really something we haven't been able to to replace quite yet and I don't think you can replace it, to be honest. I think mm -hmm. that um, it is, it's definitely, definitely a civilizing force. Uh, I talk about this in about the Middle Eastern world and sort of uh, the Asian world as well, that Islam was pretty much a civilizing force. If you read the scant accounts of the pre-Islamic Middle East, it, it's, it's far worse than... Well, on an individual level, than than what you see thereafter. But um, I completely agree with you. It's it's removing this whole idea that there is a longevity after you've expired, and there are more reasons for you to behave properly on Earth when you sort of uh, conform to a religion. Because you know, you, you see some big atheist thinkers talk about how you don't need religion to be moral and then of course you have the more moral relativistic people who would argue against morality and that uh, they, they would probably argue something more along the lines of uh, case by case individual basis but it, it, the problem is that once you remove religion you kind of free yourself from consequences which is the big thing that i talk about in the book the, the fact that there needs to be consequences for your actions. And I talk a little bit about the amygdala. I'm not a biologist or anything, but the amygdala is something that conditions your behaviors as you grow up. If you have shrunken amygdala, it, it, you're kind of like a, a rodent that snuggles up to a predator. Like you, you, if you surgically remove the amygdala from mice, it will go and cuddle up to a cat because they have no no level to perceive threats, which is one of the problems that we see in places like Sweden, Germany, and Britain, where you have all these women who've never had any long-lasting consequences for any of their actions. And then they'll hold up placards saying, refugees, welcome. And then you have like those two Scandinavian women that went to Morocco and got brutally beheaded at the end of last year. So you have this situation where people given the luxury given the sort of these all these safety nets i want to just drift onto the topic of, of social safety nets in a second but they kind of live in in an environment where they can do things but there's not going to be any consequences for it so okay well i can act on impulse i can consume i can succumb to all forms of temptations and nothing's going to come of it which is one of the problems with the removal of god because that's the removal of consequences um if if God doesn't exist, then all is permitted in, in the worldly realm. So now on, on this whole idea of the removal of consequences, since we do have a lot of wealth, we do have this incredible level of technology in Western countries, but at the same time, it removes consequences. So if you want to be a degenerate, a drunk, if you want to skip your job, well, it's okay. You can just claim welfare. If you're a woman who doesn't wait till marriage and gets knocked up by putting out to a guy who's not going to stick around, well, that's okay. You can pay child support and you can go on welfare as well. And in fact, there's an incentive structure to get more kids and there's a, a disincentive structure in so far as there being a welfare cliff, at least in America. So you see the vast majority of single mothers are on welfare. And this kind of enables people to respond to those incentives and act in a way which is sort of pretty uncivilized. So they'll do things, for example, um, before the civil rights era in the 60s, the single motherhood rate or the, um, the rate of 
childbirth out of wedlock was around five percent of course it, it steadily fluctuated throughout throughout the years but then after the introduction of the great society and sexual liberalization and abortion and contraceptives and all of these things which were supposedly meant to take out the, the childbearing elements of sex sort of desacralizing sex you just see this explosion of single motherhood rates and this explosion of illegitimacy, of illegitimacy this explosion of divorce all of these things all these um, to, to borrow one of their terms social constructs in place to make sure that people remain civil and not succumb to any whim that they may have well you basically open this pandora's box of all these sort of socially forbidden treasures and now you, you have to reap in the consequences. And not only have these sort of customs and behaviors been normalized, but if you dare to sort of condemn them, you're going to be the one who's going to be painted out as a bigot. You're the one who isn't understanding. You're the one who hasn't walked a mile in their shoes, if you catch my drift. So not only are these behaviors which promote impulsiveness normalized, but any sort of condemnation of them is just going to turn anybody into a bigot. And nobody wants to swim upstream, especially given the fact that we're social animals. Nobody wants to go against the grain and stick their neck out for what's going to be ostensibly a very small social reward. And um, then I talk a bit about politics and how sort of those who espouse liberal politics have this sort of dopamine reward feedback where by virtue signaling, they get a, a dopamine hit by doing so. So your political views are basically something similar to a mild cocaine addiction. Yeah, and I would make I would say that the consequences haven't really quite been removed. They've more just been kicked down the road right. due to technology, really, because the uh, the consequences are going to manifest themselves, and they already are. When we look at things like you know the uh, like for example child poverty, what is the the major cause of that? It's uh, single parenthood, and that's like a, that, that's a, a major problem. What but this, these consequences have, have just kind of been kicked down the road because we're still wealthy enough today that we aren't really feeling the pain that a civil that you know society in the 19th century would be feeling if they had like a, a socially sick um, a, a, all these social illnesses that we really seem to be having in the West today. Uh, that you know we the advance of technology just seems to be uh, putting us on life support, and that you know we've become civ like a civilizationally weak people. Yet uh, we have this tech, this technology that's like maintaining us, kind of. And I would also add that uh, something I have been kicking around in my mind is uh, the idea of morality and how how it really plays into things like this. And I think that one of the major problems we have today is that uh, we have mor our idea of morality in the modern world seems to be just whatever gives you the most uh, um, the most dopamine hit, whatever makes you feel like. Mm you're a, a righteous person, whatever makes you feel good. So, you know, you're moral for holding up a sign that says refugees welcome. You're amoral for, you know, saying no, because, you know, you're leaving so, some poor person from the third world out and they're not going to, you know, get a house because they won't have welfare uh, from a Western uh, economy. Uh, but I think that when I you look at religions and when you look at morality throughout civilizations in the past, uh, liberals today will point to them and say, well, look how how uh, hypocritical they were. They said that it was amoral for, you know, people to, um, I don't know, they said homosexuality was amoral, but they were going off and um, fighting wars and killing each other. How hypocritical. Well, I think that the purpose of morality played in uh, past civilizations, and I, I really still think that this is the purpose of morality, is to give society a healthy social framework so mm. you know when they were saying in the 1950s that like this lack of morality is going to um it, it's, it's bad for society you know it was easy for uh liberals in the pre in the uh in the 60s and the 70s to, to set to uh, kind of point at them and say look at these hypocrites these uh th these horrible racists who don't want to like you know go to the same school as uh people of uh, different races of them are saying that people are am amoral and you know it's easy to like kind of scoff at them when you have a conception of morality that's just uh whatever makes you feel good in this moment but they were kind of right in that you know the lack of morality has kind of caused these social uh these social illnesses that we're addressing and i think that that that's one of the major things we're lacking today is not only do we not ha uh really have a healthy morality we, can, we can't really even conceptualize morality in a way that isn't just whatever makes you, you know, feel happy, whatever makes you, uh, you know, 
feel like you're Martin Luther King, you know? Right, right. And exactly. So just a couple of things on that morality based on feeling. That's absolutely correct. You see articles from places like Slate Salon et al that promote going by your feelings. You know, we apparently live in a post-truth world, so you need to be guided by your feelings. If something feels wrong, well, then don't do it. If something feels right, do it and promote others to do it. But at the same time, since, you know, we know the education system is overwhelmingly left-wing, we know the entertainment industry is overwhelmingly left-wing, we know the media uh, complex is, is overwhelmingly left-wing as well. Sort of everything that is within the Overton window, within the socially acceptable purview of allowable opinions, that's all left-wing. And people who are brought up in this kind of milieu from you know early age, from infancy to early adulthood, and have no access or, or they don't even know challenging or opposing views they're just living in this bubble but you can see by sort of the rates of mental illnesses among these communities and the, the phenomenon of being triggered as well shows that they do mm -hmm. suffer some mm -hmm. form of cognitive dissonance it shows that they do suffer this kind of inner turmoil i think it's brought about by living inauthentically in in in, in a way that um you know, they're kind of told that you need to be welcoming to certain people, you need to be accepting, you need to be tolerant. But at the same time, these aren't virtues. And what they do is they try to magnify how virtuous they are through things like virtue signaling on social media. And well, when, when it becomes sort of, a, a, a you know, it, it becomes a vice to do things like that. And the, the, the kind of their chosen morality, which is probably foisted on them by academia the media and entertainment or their life or well, that, that kind of leads them to this sort of life of moral decrepitude where they're just tolerant to things which are only against western civilization that their moral framework is an inversion of sort of pre second world war western morality and that, that's pretty much it anything else is acceptable anything else is permitted you know if there's a new gender that's found that's fine we need to embolden these people we need to empower these people to uh, live who they want, how, how they want to be, or, or say who they profess to be. But at the same time, the morality is whatever the media, whatever academia, whatever the entertainment industry tells you it is. And this has kind of been so embedded in Western psyche that their feelings have been derived by narratives that have spun out um, from what wouldn't be a sort of a received Western history or received Western morality. These things have were constructed in, in the vacuum that was left after the Second World War when um, sort of the critical theorists hijacked academia and, you know, you have this sort of evolution down postmodernism, post-structuralism, which, which does influence a lot of modern thought and a lot of the modern thought which is pumped out by um, the sort of the three heads which construct the narrative being uh, academia, uh, entertainment and uh, the media. But what they do is they're, they're living this inauthentic life where they're told to feel such a way. So the whole Ben Shapiro thing, facts don't care about your feelings. Well, I'm sorry, Ben, from 80% of the people, feelings don't care about your facts. So, you know, I, I think that they're being conditioned to think in such a way, like it's, it's a sort of form of useful idiocy. I, I'm not saying that they're sort of dumb, but I'm saying that they sort of unsuspectingly become the foot soldiers for the kind of the globalist corporatist neoliberal agenda. Yeah. And uh, I've even made a video about one of my family members who is, you know, this uh, Marxist and he, he works for a university and I, and despite, you know, the, the universities, of course, you know, he's able to teach his own ideology to students. And despite, you know, the media and all this stuff, uh, essentially uh, spouting off what he wants. And really, you know, he claims that, you know, the West is horrible and he claims that, you know, Canadians are racist and that, you know, we're uh, founded in sin and that our existence is a crime. And he believes all this stuff that really is what's being pushed. Yet he really is just a miserable person. And uh, unfortunately, like uh, he seems depressed all the time, even though uh, it seems to be going in that direction. And I do think it is really the result of a uh, inauthentic um societal narrative really being pushed in that um, we, we really have our institutions forcing this anti-Western narrative. And I really can't blame a lot of people for going along with it because 
I tend to think that people, uh, don't, you know, like the, the idea from, from the enlightenment that everyone is this rational being who's going to analyze evidence and is going to look at science and uh, they're going to formulate their opinion based on that is nonsense. I don't think that's how it, it works. People are, like you had said, you know, uh, Ben Shapiro can say facts don't care about your feelings, but your feelings don't care about facts either. So uh, people tend to formulate their view of the, of the world based on what is very much religious in many ways and the uh, morality we've been uh, that's been implanted upon the west since world war ii is that of progressivism it is that yeah. data that has been preached in the media that's being preached in entertainment and uh, the education system this is the morality that's being uh, preached and also there's all these social pressures in place to enforce this like you know uh the more you look into it the the more you can really see that uh, it's really not something that's organic. It's something that's really being forced. Like, for example, uh, I know, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Morgoth. The, the yeah, yeah, I do. He's a great, yeah. great channel. Yes, yeah, great. he's a great channel. Um, he made a video re um, this past week about the planned social media reactions to terrorist attacks, that there was actually firms that would like pre-plan the hashtags, pre-plan the candlelight visuals, pre-plan the headlines, all of these things to react to a terrorist attack. And the, the goal was to essentially lead people away from <clears throat> any of the qu uh, really questioning uh, the legitimacy of the multicultural project mm. in that uh, the, the purpose of these campaigns was to uh, diffuse really any of the tough questions and to really uh, lead this campaign of, you know, it's not all, not all Muslims, you know, uh, don't blame, uh, don't blame an entire community and then but of course you know when it's a right-wing terrorist then that's completely flipped that it's all, all, <laughs> all white people are responsible but um what's really going on is that the um the superstructure the intelligentsia of the west today is manufacturing uh this um kind of narrative and it is manufacturing uh us going in this direction and i don't really i can't blame people for not uh I, I can't blame too, too many people for not uh, questioning it because people really don't question it. Just like in the Middle Ages, most people wouldn't have uh, questioned the Catholic Church. It was really just what was given to them. And that's and they, they lived by that because that was the uh, societal consensus. And that was the, the way that um, the way that people lived and social pressures were in place to get people to live that way. The difference is, though, that back then it actually created a healthy and prosperous civilization that flourished, whereas the um, the morality that we're given today is destructive. It's not uh, it's not meant to you know make you a better person. It's not meant to you know give your uh, give your society a, a longer time preference. It's designed to do the exact opposite. It's really designed yeah. to destroy it. Yeah, yeah, and and that's completely by design as well. Um... I think that there is sort of this idea of the permanent revolution. So you keep everyone on their toes. You never let the dust settle. You can't let that let dust settle because that's another thing I mentioned that you need for there to be this uh, semblance of at least a semblance of an enduring truth in order to have a low time preference. Mm -hmm. Because if what you know, if words evolve so rapidly and the usage of words evolves so rapidly. So for, for example, like the word queer um, in, in the 60s, it was fine in sort of the mid 2000s it wasn't and now it's fine and empowering again and, and that's completely strategic it's to keep people in a position where there is no objective truth so they're beholden to whatever narrative has been pumped out by um the intelligentsia and um that's just another big thing which is which is a huge problem and uh, in, in a sort of an ontological sense if you're if looking back because people are pretty historical historical beings a lot of who they are a lot of their identity is formed by what they've received from their parents their grandparents their myths their cultures traditions the history their statesmen their heroes you name it but that all of that has been removed by design it's been it's all of it has been excised from the western psyche now the heroes we have now are sort of these the drug adult sports uh, sports uh, personalities these vapid you know brainless celebrities these media personalities, all of these people wouldn't have a statue built after them. And a lot of the times, you know, they probably would have been relegated to the gutter of society. People like Plato and St. Augustine um, thought that 
thought that uh, actors should be politically disenfranchised because all their life is is uh, dissimulation. It, it's it, it's not authentic. You're you're playing a life that isn't your own, and this is one of the hugest problems that we have because we are meant to be identityless by design. And, and going back to what you said about Morgoth's video is that they, they control the narrative. They also can control the dialectics of, of things too. So say that the, the, the thesis, or sorry, the, the thesis would be Western society is progressive, it's tolerant, it's great. The antithesis is that, you know, you have these Islamic attacks because I, I don't think that they can conform to modernity. They're given too much free reign. It kind of sends them over the edge. And of course, Western foreign policy has got a role to play. So the synthesis would be to make sure that, that it's mitigated and we can still keep this facade of Western tolerance by holding candle vigils, playing Don't Look Back in Anger, have some guy cutting around a piano playing John Lennon's Imagine, which I actually um, mentioned in the book because that is the song which embodies high time preferences. It's sort of this childish utopian world where everyone can just have eternal commies with luxury, what was it, fully automated luxury gay space communism. <laughs> and and, and that, that's what people want. And that's, the, that's the kind of world where people want, where everything is just a, a spiraling sequence of sort of creative destruction and dopamine hits. That's basically what life is meant to become for some of these people. And if you don't give it to them, they will get angry. Have you seen some of these Twitter personalities or YouTube personalities on the hard left who are pointing the finger at the white working class as being the obstacle to their contrived utopia? Yeah, and, and uh, I believe that it was, uh, I believe it was uh, Steven Pinker that had said in his book that uh, the, the um, grievances of the white working class in America don't matter because in uh in 20 well in 30 40 years they won't exist anymore they're being replaced so you know th their grievances simply are null and void really and, and it's just like the um uh it's just like you know this this um need to constantly just like destroy and this need to constantly just uh, uh tear things apart it's something that's really just been really implanted in into the western uh well, well it's, be it's being implanted um forcibly upon the west right now and i think that uh, what, one of the, one of the problems is that, you know, how do you get people out of this? There, there needs to be a way that, um, there needs to be a way to, you know, move on from that because, uh, and, and the, you know, the way I think people are going to get out of that with, if it is, I think reality is just going to hit people a lot harder because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think that there's going to be, uh, you know, transgenderism 40 years from now. I don't think there's going to be, uh, you know, I don't think feminism is going to last, you know, forever. Like the, the, one of the problems is that, um, uh, progressives really see history, history in a, as a straight line. It's the concept known as the, as Whig history, which they see it as, you know, they're pro progressing towards John Lennon's imagine. And anyone who says otherwise is just getting in the way of us getting to John Lennon's imagine. But you know, what they don't really seem to be able to conceptualize is that, you know, that might end and that, you know, what, comes after that might be something that is uh, a lot harder to exist in. And this is kind of the, the cycle of history that people on the right tend to view it through that, you know, um, over, time, uh, over time, you know, societies do become decadent and they decline and they are, and you know, their sense of uh, comfort, their sense of, uh, of, of, of uh, you know, material wealth and all this stuff, this doesn't last forever. And something will uh, come up in the future and eventually, you know, just tear that all down because, you, you know, you can't really exist for a hundred. Uh, there's just no way that the West as it exists today can carry itself into the next century. It'll either a um, have to you know, reinvent itself or um, it will be destroyed and supplanted by something else. Yeah, that's right. And it's very interesting what you say about sort of pro progressivism, sort of living, looking at history through almost a teleological lens uh, towards this sort of idea of utopia, when in actual fact, I mean, there's plenty of, amp there's ample evidence uh, almost giving you the cyclical view, the sort of Spenglerian view of history. And we definitely are in the sort of, I think we're almost in the post winter phase of um, Western society, to, to be quite sad, but there are some things you can do in order to sort of buck, to to reverse the trend. Um, and it's interesting what you're saying about Stephen Pinker because there was something that you also said previously. That I just wanted to quickly mention when when you mentioned Ben Shapiro too, is that the sort of the the, the fallacious right left dichotomy that you've got now is all under this sort of liberal 
um, paradigm. There's almost nothing outside. I'm, I'm not a Duganist, but he's kind of got a point where the current political theater is within this liberal framework. And um, I, I think that you see quite the opposite. I, I mean, people aren't going to die for neoliberalism. People are going to die for family faith and and uh, the nation uh, and nothing else. And you could probably make the case, or you could easily make the case, that uh, nation and faith are offshoots of family if you want to go down to a sort of hair-splitting level. And people have an emotional you know, um, connection to who their family is it's it's you've got to be completely almost insincere to suggest that people are going to care about a stranger from somewhere a few continents away than they are about their own children that's that's just a complete lack of insincerity of sincerity um and it's very interesting that you know you see this this instance where you all like these cat ladies these cool wine aunts and wine mummies or pit mummies what do you want to call them um who don't have a family of their own and a lot of the sort of these the coastal bugmen types who always welcome in these other people, well, they don't have kids of their own. They don't have a genetic legacy to preserve. They don't crave that stability because they don't really have any skin in the game after they've gone. And this is a huge problem for Western politicians too, especially in Europe. So people like Macron, Macron doesn't have any uh, known biological children of his own. Theresa May didn't have any biological children of her own. Angela Merkel didn't have any biological children of her own. I don't think Jean-Claude Juncker did. Uh, Leo Varadkar in Ireland doesn't. And and look what's happening in all of these countries. They're the ones which are going through the most dramatic demographic changes and what of the future well they're either going to be out of office or they're going to be worm food so why do they care and i, I think a lot of it um this sort of this this disconnection from familial ties is what brings in this political nihilism where now it's just a competition to show who can be the trendiest, who can be the most tolerant statesman, rather than one who takes care of the family. Look at look at what's happening in Hungary. Victor Orban's incredibly popular, according to whatever the mainstream polls are published, and he promotes family values. Now, uh, Romans, I think it was Philip the Arab that tried to promote uh, sort of these tax credit incentives to promote um, birth rates, but he didn't have much success. And that was towards the end. I think it was in the third century AD. And now that he's doing it for families uh, with more than four children. So at least he's trying something. You can see that there is a definite difference between Central and Eastern Europe and sort of the more decadent uh, Western Europe. Yes, and I, I, the other topic that brings uh, that you that you mentioned there that I'm also very interested in is uh, I am of the belief that the democratic system greatly reduces a civilization's time period uh, time yeah. preference yeah. because, uh, like you had mentioned, uh, these politicians. I mean, like let's take uh, Theresa May for example. Like her reign as uh, prime minister of Great Britain was disastrous. I, I mean, you probably know better than I do. Uh, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. She's been the, the worst prime minister in the last 50 years, probably since the post-war period. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, what the big, one of the big failings of liberalism and of democracy in my estimation is that uh, someone like her is not going to suffer any consequences uh, for really screwing uh, over a nation or Angela Merkel, like for um, the uh, policy in regards to uh, mass migration, especially back in 2015. Uh, none of these politicians really face any uh, real, um, they face no personal loss for uh, destructive uh, actions they're imposing upon their own societies. And I don't think this would really happen in a, uh, under, in a system which people have a, the, the, or at least the leaders, have a greater sense of skin in the game, that there actually is something that they, uh, that they lose for doing a bad job. They, they're actually incentivized. Whereas in a democratic system, they're only really the only real incentive that our politicians are given is their own career. So you know their own 10, 15 year career, and you know their four years in office, whatever that may be. And you know that that's just one of the reasons they just give in to all these uh, global um, pressures being placed mm-hmm. upon them. And like for example, the, the, that great example would be Theresa May. That the people voted for Brexit, but uh, she was willing to essentially screw over the country to not deliver that because 
uh, international pow- uh, pressures were being placed on her to not deliver it. And uh, Mark Collette did a, an excellent uh, stream on really the ex- to the extent to which uh, the British establishment was willing to sell out uh, their country to appease uh, these people. And I don't think that would happen under another system. I've made the argument in the past that I do think uh, a system like monarchy, not that I think it's implementable, but uh, as a um, as an example, is a system that tends to be lo- a lot more long-term oriented because the monarch has a lot bigger of a connection to the uh, society that he rules and that you know his personal prestige is very much connected to the uh, success of that of that nation or kingdom or whatever it is. And not only that, but his own personal safety is connected to it because many we've seen many times in history when monarchy when monarchs have done a bad job, they've been they've been killed by their people or mm-hmm. and not only that, but it also is a system that passes on that um, uh, that rule to another to their heir. So you know the monarch has this uh, incentive to, do a good job because they want their heir to have uh, a prosperous um, reign just like they did. So it's just an example of a system that, you know, under the under kind of the liberal context that we've been given, we're supposed to see it as horrible and oppressive and evil. But then when you look at just um, when you look at, you know, uh, beyond a, a the frame of reference of, you know, a couple decades, it is a system that has been relatively successful in many different civilizations and i think that there's a re- there's a reason for that it is one that is a lot more long-term oriented what would you say to that yeah i absolutely agree with you uh nick land's got a very good uh, quotation when it comes to describing democracy and high time preferences being sort of like a feeding frenzy and i, I kind of mentioned that i i draw the comparison of sort of uh, piranhas and uh, a calf that's fallen fallen off a riverbank when it comes to democracy because you know a lot, a lot of politicians who wish to be in office think in election cycles so there was a very interesting thing i got shown in when i was living in argentina which was interest rates and public spending and it was cross reference to election time so the year of an election public spending would increase just for any any old infrastructure they just dig up the roads and fill them in again pretty much because a lot of the roads there and a lot of the pavements there were just shambolic and the other one was interest rates would drop so it would give the illusion that business was thriving on election year when when they were incumbent and then when they're out of office when they retired well i I don't give a damn you know (laughs) europe survives what say over a thousand years of of monarchies and it's taken less than three, what, about three generations of liberal democracy in its current form to bring it to its knees, because there is no skin in the game. There, there is no sort of emotional attachment to the future. And um, of course, now it's a lot worse than it, it was, say, two or three generations ago, when statesmen would have more children, when they might have been God-fearing, for example, and they might have ascribed to a higher form of morality, which you know, which would kind of incentivize them to have more kids or you know you, you can't just sleep around because there would be dire consequences in the afterlife for um for for, for your sins it's just as an example and i'm just throwing that out there that uh, this is one of the reasons why i think lgbt uh, politics have been weaponized in order to remove the the creation of life aspect out of sex and, and now of course since the the modern left don't really have anything economic to offer people anymore they can't really offer much more welfare um so now it's just sort of more social freedom um so what's next and of course the other thing the other economic thing is going to be on a a group or race by case basis where they're going to start offering reparations for supposedly wronged groups for historic grievances um but you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, when it comes to democracy, people think in election cycles. And if you, especially if you, the, the same people who bankroll the politicians, the ability to take control of the money supply and the, the tax structure, well, they can just redistribute to their heart's content to win elections. And, and now in the case of, say, Britain, Germany, France, and America, 
you don't even need to offer people anything because now you've got these sort of monolithic voting blocks in along sort of ethnic lines. You, you know, Latinos vote 70, 75% in favor of the Democrats, blacks 90, 95%. Uh, East Asians about 55, 60, 65%. And then it's only whites that vote for the Republican Party. Well, why didn't the Republican Party do anything about it? Because they benefit off these uh, leftist policies, these demographically shifting leftist policies because all the neoliberal companies that support them get to increase the the workforce and pay lower wages for high levels of productivity. So it, it, it's all money. It's all mon monetarily um, um, put together, unfortunately. And it's it's whoever has the biggest uh, wallets who can basically take control over how political decisions are made. But it's, it's a real shame. And I don't think there is a happy ending to this, given the fact that the national debts and debt to GDP ratios in Western countries are just enormous. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think that when looking at uh, alt, uh, alternative civilizations, uh, I, I, this might sound controversial to many people on the right, and I know there's a tendency for people to look at Islam and you know think uh, it's like the embodiment of evil. And I, I think that you know we need to uh, put aside the lens of uh, universalism because w when we look at it through that lens, it, you, people tend to look at Islam as this evil force. But you know we can. We can agree that we don't want Islam in the West. Like, I don't want it in the West. I would like it to be removed. Uh, I, I would like its influence removed from the West and to, you know, obviously prevent uh, further migration into the West from the Middle East or from North Africa. But um, when you look at societies like uh, Saudi Arabia or um, the UAE or even some of these other ones, that, there actually does seem to be a, a civilizational plan. Like the, they seem to have a view, a vision for the future. Someone like Erdogan in Turkey, his um, his action is being taken. Uh, he's taking actions that will ensure Turkey's uh, prosperity or at least power far beyond his own lifetime. In that he's knowingly colonizing countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, because he knows that this increases the power of the Turkish nation. Like just look no further than, than the uh, Denk party in the Netherlands, which is essentially a uh, Turkish interest group, which has three seats in the Den in the Danish parliament. And um, there actually is a vision for the future there. And a lot of that is through illiberal values because these are not liberal regimes. Turkey is becoming less and less liberal of a regime Saudi Arabia is a, it's an absolute monarchy. Uh, um, the UAE, like the UAE is probably my favorite example because um, it's relatively wealthy. It's a, for its citizens, it's relatively free, uh, but it's a, a you know, a, and it's a, a relatively safe country for them too, but it's a um, very conservative society and it's not, a, it's not a liberal one at all either. It's a, it's a monarchy. And I actually saw this one interesting video of a, uh, Emirati uh, citizen speaking about the UAE, and I don't, I, I don't know if I'd be able to find the video today, but uh, he had a very, he had very interesting things to say about it. That uh, he had a sense that you know the the leadership, the uh, uh, structure of the UAE, really had his, his own and his family's best interests in mind, and that you know he, he felt like he was part of something bigger than himself. And you know, it just he just seemed to have a uh, an amount of uh, self actualization that I don't see in Westerners today. Now, I, you know, just so nobody misunderstands, I know I don't want to import, uh, I, I I don't want more Muslim immigration. But for for their own context, they do seem to be running a civilization, or at least some Islamic countries, they do seem to be running a civilization against what you know the West today considers to be liberal and acceptable, they, they are running one against that. And long term, they're going to win that battle because they have a vision for the future and they know that uh, they can essentially take advantage of the liberal West by actually, uh, by, you know, by, by things like, uh, you know, these uh, political parties they have by funding their these mosques in Europe. There's a real vision for the future there. And we're really missing that in the West today. Yeah, I, I think it's like we have an autoimmune disease, you know, <clears throat> you're kind of attacking any of the cells looking to repel pathogens. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, I honestly can't see a sort of very 
uh, vulnerable Christianity holding much of a candle to a very sort of um, emboldened Islam. And, you, you know, Islam is getting kind of reformed in Western countries to a certain degree when there is more um, sort of uh, proximity to Westerners. For example, there was recently the first Muslim LGBT pride parade in Birmingham, which is, Birmingham is a very, very Muslim city in England. Uh, 5% of the population don't speak a word of English. Uh, considering it's the second largest city in the UK, which is, is it's pretty frightening, that prospect. And you see, uh, it was 140,000 Muslims showed up to a park there for a prey last year. So I don't see secular values being able to withstand Islam because they're going to have to go against what they preach. They're going to have to go against their, their cherished liberal values in order to ensure that a greater evil in their mind doesn't take over. But I don't think they have it in them. There's something very interesting that E. Michael Jones talked about, which I have noticed as well, is this phenomenon where lots of people who come from these very hyper-tolerant sort of left libertarian, anarcho-communist or sort of anarcho-feminist backgrounds and then convert to Islam because of a lack of order in their life. They need order and structure. But Christianity is off limits because they spent most of their adolescence and adult life demonizing Christianity, sort of holding it up as the highest evil. It's oppressive. So well, they join Islam because they hear nothing uh, negative about it. Or if they do hear something negative about it, they'll just go after the naysayer. Uh, and, and it's just quite ironic. I think people do, in a way, crave order. So this whole idea, like, for libertarianism, where everyone can be sort of the duke of their own private property, I, I think that there is a Pareto principle involved that you do have sort of an 80% of people who desperately need a leadership. They, they can't come up with this sort of self-guiding libertarianism where they're just uh, sort of subject to market forces and pricing. They, they need something greater, sort of a form of an aristocracy or a hierarchy to follow. Otherwise, they just resort to this sort of wayward, self-destructive hedonism, which is what's running amok in a lot of Western cities. Uh, I, I, having lived in the UK, if you go out to a pub or a nightclub, on a Saturday or Friday night, you'll just see a lot of guys who are on steroids with tribal tattoos, wearing the most expensive brand clothing, trying to hook up with these very ugly women who are heavily made up with eyeliner, bleach blonde hair, their tits hanging out, their ass hanging out, and getting absolutely hammered, taking cocaine, ecstasy, you name it, you name it. It's a sight to behold. Obviously, it's not for everyone, but this is what's happened to a lot of the, the white working class and low middle classes, and even these new people from Pakistan and Bay of Bengal areas that partake in this sort of very degenerate Western culture. And it's a very sorry sight to see because that implies that there isn't really much hope for the future if they're engaging in these things which could have potentially deadly consequences. I'm not going to be a, a square or anything, but the, these kind of behaviors aren't good for you in the long term. We have the data on why promiscuity is bad for you in the long run and um, how it can be emotionally damaging for future relationships. But there is that temptation now. The consequences have been obscured from your view. You, you've been told that, well, this is good. The narrative in the media is, well, this is what the cool people do. And the rap songs on the radio or the hip hop, I, I don't really listen to much contemporary music, but a lot of it is suggestive of this kind of lifestyle. So what of the future? It, it, it's, it's more of a way to kind of stave off boredom because you know, i don't know if you've read much ernst younger i uh, pain yes i i have i have read yeah. some of i've read some of storm steel yeah yeah it, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of there just to give you stimulus really just to kind of make you feel alive because the modern world is so bereft of meaning it doesn't really offer anything else yeah and i think that the answer is that there needs to be kind of a uh, at least the first thing that really needs to happen is there needs to be kind of a revival of culture because, you know, culture is one of the uh, various means through which um, it, uh, people perpetuate their own uh, group. They perpetuate their own civilization because, you know, uh, the idea that, you know, you're uh, if you take like something like a traditional dance, the idea that they do this uh, dance in this part of the city and they wear this uh, clothing and they, they have all these like, you know, traditions that, you know, when you think of, when you break them down, when you dissect them, they don't make sense. But to the people uh, that that practice them, 
they make them feel it, it gives them a sense of belonging. It makes them feel like they're in uh, their own uh, society. It, it makes them feel like, you know, they're part of something bigger and it, it just, you know, kind of fills people with this uh, sense of um, joy that you, you really can't get otherwise. And I think that just, there needs to be like a revival of culture first, because, you know, I don't think that um, people are go like you had said earlier, no one's going to go to, uh, no one's going to go off to war for neoliberalism. And, you know, one of the big lies that we've been sold in, uh, in the West for the last 70 years is that uh, liberalism is the only uh, cause to fight. And this comes from kind of the, the foundation myth we have of the Second World War, that uh, the Second World War was about liberalism. And it was liberalism against fascism, which it very much wasn't, because even for uh, uh, the allies, you know, who... Um, we're told fought for liberalism, none of them would have, uh, would have supported the liberal paradigm of the present day. And when they were, when I think of, you know, people in 19, in the 1940s going off to war, I don't think very many of them were thinking about democracy. They weren't really thinking about, uh, what we're told they were, they are today They're you know, they're going off to fight for their communities, their friends, their family, their, uh, their culture, their sense of belonging that they have in within their own, nation. And yes, we, I do agree that the war was very destructive, but, um, that, that really is what people, you know, go and go and fight and die for. And that's really what motivates people. I mean, you can even look, uh, you know, for example, uh, even during the world war two, during world war two, uh, the Soviets even had this, uh, sense of father of like fatherland that we're going off to fight for our nation and our country and our land. It, you know, it wasn't about, uh, I don't think it was about communism for them. And just like, you know, in Britain and France and Canada, America, I don't think it was about liberalism. It was more about uh, a sense of culture. But, um, and I, I think that if you're actually going to get people in the West to again, uh, uh, start to think long-term and actually, you know, take seriously the idea that, you know, you're in a civilization that, and that you need to maintain that for the next generation. It does, it does start with, with culture. And that's why nationalism is such a powerful force uh, yeah. in this direction. And I think that is also why the uh, mainstream is so afraid of the populism right now, because they know that uh, people can't be controlled that, you know, uh, nationalism is something that is, I admit, I admit it is not rational. It's, it's a, a very emotional feeling, but it's something that is a lot more difficult to control because you can't really, uh, you know, someone who actually like, you know, deeply loves their own culture and their own uh, land and has a, um, a a real strong connection to that. You can't really change their mind through just arguing that, well, uh, well if we bring in all these uh, refugees, well, it'll improve our economy. It will. Uh, oh, well, we need it to uh, pay for our, our aging population, even though, of course, we actually when we look at the data, we know that's a lie. But it's a lot harder to actually um, to actually push that agenda when uh, people in the West are standing up for something that matters a, a lot more to them than just the material. Do, do you kind of see that as a trend? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's sort of this uh, Francis Fukuyama uh, end of history ideal. It's just complete baloney. And and it's just the sort of, it kind of encapsulates this neoliberal hubris, which is so dominant in the, in the ranks. Like the, the idea that you can get people to become something that they're not to lay aside their nation because well, a lot of them don't have kids that that's one of the reasons why they don't really have a good concern in the future um and i, I think that this the, the the whole idea that because we still were under this kind of a, a, a liberal but more of an implicit liberal paradigm back then when people went off to war to, to supposedly defend their nature after much media propagandizing it, it, it's kind of dabs on the whole idea of liberalism and how we're rational agents rather than slaves to our, our emotions because you need to find a way to kind to, to mediate or how to get people to not conform to many of their passions which is why morality and religion is such a powerful civilizing force in order to prevent these kind of uh, the, the sort of this kind of neo babylonian experiment from from just getting worse and worse because th that's the only thing people have to offer now is just more social freedom how much more social freedom can you offer and not only that you subsidize it Th there's this kind of this this redistribution from the productive members of society to the less productive members of societies so, and 
it's having a dysgenic effect in the long term because middle class earners. Now, uh, I'm not a libertarian, and I think economics should really be a backburner topic. And I think the sooner we can get rid of this house of cards that based economy the better but it's going to have dreadful consequences because as you said earlier in the stream it's just kicking the consequences further down the road and with things like quantitative easing which is meant to stimulate consumption in order to stave off a recession well you're just inflating the bubble even bigger you're just kicking it's like going to have it's going to have a snowball effect it's going to be worse and even you know bailing out the bankers for example that within the sort of a democratic framework that's fine because it means that your party is going to at least have credence in the future at least have some some of its so, sorry some of its credibility in the future when it comes to election time down the line i'm just thinking about the labor party when they when they bailed out the the, the banking cartels in in the uk um which would have crumbled but that would have meant 35 percent of the population wouldn't have had access to their funds which of course would have been disastrous now we you've, you've made a bed that you can't really lie in anymore and um I'm, I'm sorry i've drifted off topic a lot so just no problem so the other thing i i, I talk about a bit because time preferences is almost sort of inextricably linked to economics and the whole realm of economics is of course what, what i'm proposing and I, I i fully recognize this you're not going to go back to a gold standard or a silver standard or any form of hard money anytime soon the the reality is that i don't think you're even going to go, going to, go to ubi soon i know that people like yang are promoting it and there are some positive and negative incentives towards ubi and I do mention them in the book, but I, one of the reasons why I don't think that's going to be an eventuality is because it would mean that a lot of bureaucracy is going to have to be restructured and it might claim a lot of government workers because it would mean that other forms of welfare would be made redundant in their current form. But uh, the, the other thing is modern monetary theory. So I, I talk about how current and past economic policies and tax policies have promoted high time preferences so a lot of government policies such as this gradual rate of inflation to prevent uh, sorry monetary inflation to, pre to prevent price deflation in the future to prevent a recession and lowering interest rates um below the market rate below what would be the natural market rate do cause some problems and they do promote consumerism and as I was saying earlier, that you have this dysgenic effect, which is it's, it's going to be hugely detrimental. Of course, it's it's going to be minimal in comparison to mass immigration, but nevertheless, it's still there. And the fact that saving is being discouraged because saving gives you an opportunity to practice low time preferences. It, it gives you an opportunity to think towards the future, not to succumb to having to pull out your credit card whenever you want something. Now, you have to acquire it you have to feel a sense of accomplishment before you can purchase something lavish before you can buy a car obviously buying a house outright for most people is going to be impossible without a mortgage there are other sort of pre-existing conditions you need to address such as uh, the current rates of population um f modern feminism and the doubling of the workforce all, all these other things all these other factors but at the same time I do bring up the fact that economics is very important to kind of keeping time preferences low, especially especially savings, and especially where money retains its value. Um, because if 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 you don't have any hard assets, if say you're you're um, working class, you're working paycheck to paycheck, you can't really save. Obviously, because economic reality dictates that you can't you don't have the money to save. But even if you do put some money away in the bank. The interest on your bank account they're going to give you is going to be less than the rate of inflation and you're going to just lose the value of your money while it's sat there so there's this temptation to exchange it for something that holds its intrinsic value longer than a couple of days yeah so i mean i i think that the situation i see is that uh we have one that we have a, a system that people aren't uh aren't motivated to work in order to maintain but they're more motivated in order to uh essentially keep up their own uh, standard of living and uh, they seem to be becoming more and more reliant on that and I don't really it, it's a really difficult situation to find a way out of 
I haven't really thought of, you know, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen really in the future because, you know, you do have the, the situation with, uh, you know, the debts, the welfare. And then when you add mass immigration into that, it just makes everything worse. And then you we're also left with the, the problem of kind of the, uh, debased, um, society where someone where like, you know, like, as we were mentioning earlier, no one really has a sense of belonging anywhere. Um, where do you see it really going from here? Like, what, what do you think really is going to come next? And do you think that, I mean, do you think there's any, any way out of this kind of, uh, um, short term, uh, time preference, uh, uh, kind of disease that we've caught in the West? There are some things you can do. And in the last three, four years alone, I've noticed more and more people getting sick of it. The younger generations, more, more people are becoming denormified. Um, they're kind of getting a bit sick of the narrative that they've been given. I, I think they look around and see that it's a lot of the time it's pretty inauthentic, which is positive. And it's going to make one, people want to live a more quiet and maybe less trendy life, having a family, owning property having kids and, and all that kind of stuff. But those are pretty much the only things you can really do. And the, the other thing that we haven't really addressed is apart from the intelligentsia promoting these narratives, a lot of it in, especially in coastal cities in America, London, Paris, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, you name it, you have these sort of social structures, these social arrangements where it's now sort of acceptable to be a certain way. Now I, I do use a couple of examples sort of when it comes to fat acceptance i think that's one example where it's not a bad thing to judge people it, it shows that you care you, you you know there is this sort of this uh indifference towards people which i think is worse than hatred because it doesn't sort of it doesn't give that person agency it kind of excludes the possibility for their, their existence it excludes the possibility for you to give them any of your time or, or efforts in thinking about them where you let people just balloon up or just drink too much or, or you know, maybe lead a uh, sexually licentious lifestyle where they're just sort of slaves to their passions. And now it's almost socially acceptable to tell, not, not to tell them anything. You're, you're the one who's in the wrong if you pass judgment on them. But there is this lack of a, a sort of a, a family figure above them, sort of guiding them in life. So they're basically just floating in a sea of relativism. Who knows where they're going to land? Who knows where they're going to go? Who cares? I mean, I'm not going to care. I'm not going to pass judgment. I don't want to be called a bigot. I mean, there's a, a, a disincentive structure to tell somebody to call them out on their bullshit, which is it's, it's, it's dreadful, to be honest. But um, socially, I think we're going to see a greater rift in society you're going to see left and right probably become more polarized i saw a graphic recently where the rights kind of remained the same it's still within this liberal um overton window but the left has radically shifted towards the left to oh that the was from left. yes that was from pure some, research oh sorry right but yes. there's another thing that you need to bear in mind just, just real quick there's another thing you really need to bear in mind is the fertility rates of the right versus the left so Every bit further right somebody goes, the fertility rate increases. And every bit further left you go, the fertility rate decreases. So what you're seeing is you're, you're seeing these people jumping off a leftward cliff, but they're not having kids to replace themselves. It's a self-defeating ideology, whereas people on the right, that's a self-propagating ideology. So they're the ones who are having kids. They're the ones who are going to pass on their values. They're the ones who are going to tell their children to avoid uh, listening to the narrative to maybe not watch too, as much TV, go to church, be upstanding members of the community. Whereas the left, well, they're bringing new people in because they can't field their own. That's the way that they can sort of replicate their ideology. And as Edward Dustin would say, it's, it's, a, it's a form of mutation. Their ideas get to permeate the institutions. But I, 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 the only thing I can see is a collapse of a lot of the major, major institutions. And I, I think that society is going to become more and more uh, ideologically separated yeah I, I what i see is that there really is something that's going to need to come in and fill the void because the void of of liberalism then kind of the narrative that we've been given it's empty and i think people are turning away from that and you know what, what i often think of as kind of the the one thing that really kind of drives home just the emptiness of of liberalism and you know what we're told that our grandparents you know fought a world war to to preserve when 
you know, of course, it's not a very true narrative. But um, when I look at like you know the at the Western world, and I look at um, these uh, polls from Pew Research on uh, what percentage of people would fight for their country, and most countries mm -hmm. in Western Europe, it was in the twenty, it was in the twenties. So I think like uh, the Netherlands mm -hmm. had like fifteen percent of people said they would fight for the Netherlands. Uh, I think like something like twenty percent said they would fight for the UK. America, it was a little higher. Uh, Eastern Europe, it was actually like in the fifties and six and sixties. But then when I look at the Islamic world, uh, a country like um, uh, Morocco, I believe it was, it had like ninety five percent. And you know, these Muslim, uh, um, the Muslim will will blow himself up for what he believes, and he's never experienced liberalism. He's never. Uh, well, they may have voted, but you know they've never experienced liberal democracy as we know it. They've never uh, had you know gay marriage. They've never had you know feminism and all that stuff. Uh, yet they are they believe in their uh, their metaphysical um, existence to such an extent that they will blow themselves up to save that. While whereas in the West we have all this material wealth and really the liberal system that we've been given. Um, no one wants to no one has any belief in it like for exa uh, another example is that in canada i remember re reading recently that there um the amount of people actually willing to enroll for the armed forces was going way way down they had to drop the um they had to drop the standards because there wasn't enough physically fit people to actually meet the standards uh in america too it's um the amount the amount of people investing in, in the armed forces was uh, or not investing, uh, enrolling in the armed forces was a lot lower. And it really is that people have kind of just been so debased from their core civilization that uh, they're looking for something to fill that void. And I do think something will fill that void. And that's why I think kind of the, uh, the surge of uh, populism, which is kind of, I guess, morphing into nationalism, which we hope, we, we certainly hope it does. I think that that has real legs because not only does it address some of the economic concerns people have, it also actually get, provides them with something that they can actually, they can, they can actually fight for that is, a, that they've really kind of lost touch with. And I think that that, that is kind of where the pathway we're going down. So I do think that, yes, we are going to have the, pro, um, a more divided society because, you know, you're, when you add in the things like Islam, you add in the mass migration and then you add in the, um, the ideological uh, differences, there is, gonna, I think, going to be a very, uh, a lot more ideologically divided society. And I just wonder, you know, how long will these progressive institutions be able to uh, maintain control? Because, you know, they do seem to be panicking right now. In my in the stream I had a couple weeks ago, one thing I had said was that they're kind of shifting in propaganda from uh, propaganda that's designed to, uh, you know, um, what I call it is positive and negative propaganda. Pro positive mm -hmm. propaganda is propaganda designed to legitimize a regime. So saying, you know, diversity is our strength and stuff like that. And negative propaganda is meant to delegitimize its enemies. So saying, you know, like uh, white supremacist, far right, neo-Nazi, whatever on the rise. And, you know, you have to watch out for these people. Uh, that I see a lot more of that today than I see... Um, of the positive propaganda, which is a very, which to me, it tells me that you know, a lot less people are really kind of buying the lies that they're selling. And I think that's a good thing. And I, you know, I think that, yes, we are, we are in for uh, a rocky road ahead because uh, it's certainly not a uh, stable uh, situation. But I do think though that, um, you know, generally through uh, chaos, order usually comes back, usually reasserts itself in some way. And, you know, I, I tend to think that that that, that will happen again. So I'm, I'm certainly not black I, I'm certainly not black on the issue because um, we, we are seeing changes happening right now. And I, and I think that it's uh, at least going in the right direction, though. You know, of course, there's a pretty big uh, hill to overcome. So, uh, yeah, uh, we've been going for about uh, almost an hour and a half now. Uh, we'll end probably in a couple minutes. Uh, so any last words on, on your book or, you know, your ideas or thesis or just any, anything you'd like anyone to know about the book? Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be out on June 1st. I'll be posting it all over Twitter, Gab, Facebook. I'll probably stream about it and hopefully talk to some, uh, so, so some people to help me promote it. But uh, apart from that, I don't really have anything 
that of, of great import to add. But the one thing I wanted to quickly just um, pitch to you on top of yes, what no you problem. were saying about the, the, the sort of the uh, this this institutional collapse that we are due to, to see because progressive have taken over almost every single institution as per Robert Conquest. Was this the second rule of, po uh, of yes, politics? Yes, uh, any, yeah. uh, any institution that's not, uh, that's not constitutionally right wing will become left wing. Right, right. And I, I think that's just like a natural course of entropy for most things, even civilization itself, civilization as, as an organism. And uh, you do get, you do see a decline in things as uh, words, truth, and morality evolves as society evolves. But we, we're going at such a fast pace that it's, it's difficult to keep on board at times. Uh, if you, if that's if you subscribe to the neoliberal uh, narrative or the progressive worldview, it, you know, it, it, as I said before, it's by design. It's to instill nihilism. It's just instill sort of ideological dependency on the the establishment agenda. But the one thing I just really wanted to quickly add was I think there needs to be maybe more emphasis placed on physiognomy and aesthetics because you look at your enemies and you, like the, the people who are even, you know, say Emily Ryotowski who got naked to protest abortion and people do respond to incentives. So going down the line, a very attractive woman getting undressed to express a frustration at a political decision that's out of her control. Well, what does that suggest? Well, let, let's do more of it. Let's be more. Let's be against it more. But one, one thing I wanted to quickly talk about was just the, the sheer ugliness of maybe spiritual and physical of a lot, a lot of people who propose these radical views. And I think a lot of the time it is for the sake of self-propagation that under any other conditions, under any other, I, I know it, it's kind of sometimes it's termed as bio, bio Leninism. It's, it's sort of this form of inversion. Uh, sort of biological inversion to instill hierarchy. So the, the most the wretched members of society rise to the top without having to do much, which gives very sort of morally repugnant people the ability to claim power. As we can see in the rest, West, we do have a, 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 a plutocracy, a very strong money power that needs people who aren't exactly very happy with who they are, with their identity to kind of uh, be their lapdogs uh, and be sort of the uh, guardians of all these institutions. So you look at uh, a lot of these academics, they're not very pretty people, they don't have kids of their own. But so they're the perfect foot soldiers for a world which requires hyper-materialist consumerism. And that's another thing I, I do mention in the book, that you can't have any values greater than yourself because you need to have something to fill in that void, which is consumer goods, and you can't have an identity well, what fills an identity when you can't have faith, family, or, or um, the nation? Well, it's, it's consumer brands. People like to be seen with Calvin Klein or uh, French Connection UK, whatever it is, because that gives them a the semblance of identity. And I think we do have this sort of very dystopian commodification of what can be conceived to be a form of identity. And uh, this is something I want to mention beforehand with people like Jordan Peterson and Steven Pinker who, and, and the whole sort of internet dark web who are very averse to anybody having a form of collective identity because you know you, you better strive for mediocrity and hyper individualism because otherwise you'd be a bigot. You wouldn't want to be a, an SAW now, would you? But um, at the same time, that, that, that just disarms you from doing anything effective towards the left's hyper-racialization and uh, intersectionalism, which is there to deliberately use a tactic of divide and conquer yes and um like you had said like the aesthetic really matters because you know when you just look at uh when you just look at a lot of people uh on the left and you know this is kind of just a, a symptom of the society we live in but a lot of them are very uh un unesthetically pleasing individuals and <laughs> You know, uh, I think that one thing, the, the best thing that you can do personally, I think, is uh, try to be a respectable person. Try to actually, you know, exercise, dress well, and you know, don't don't be like that because um, people do are just attracted to um, people. They they can they can tell who is um, who is a attractive person and who isn't. And you know, despite all like the fat accept acceptance stuff you know, that stuff just doesn't work. People know uh, who is and who isn't. And uh, there was actually one last question I wanted to ask, uh, because this is actually a th the theme of uh, my next video. It's, uh, do you feel that a lot of the uh, 
the these problems are the result of uh, bad ideology, or do you feel that um, kind of the uh, a, a wider societal sickness has more um, given us the ideology to justify that? So, do you think that that like you know it was bad ideas that brought us this way, or do you think it was more just a kind of a, a um, uh, kind of just uh, human decadence and uh, just uh, civilization like its morality dying and the ideology has kind of justified that. What would you say your take on that is? It's both. It's both. Um, you, you can place the beginning of the Enlightenment values and liberalism. And I, I, I conflate them sometimes when I do my streams. I, I say that Enlightenment and Protestant, Enlightenment values, Protestantism, and then liberalism and capitalism, you, sort of the, the original capitalism that was painted as laissez-faire, which was really just propped up state capitalism state mercantilism it wasn't the, the the kind of the smithian vision or the rothbardian vision of uh, a laissez-faire world but at the same time i think since the industrial revolution given the advancements in medicine given the technological advancements the advancements in agricultural production and all these things a lot of people who wouldn't have survived childbirth or wouldn't have survived pregnancy or wouldn't have been born at all are now alive so uh, people who are of significantly weaker stock and I, I know this is very very controversial and almost you know it, it's, it's almost a nasty thing to say but a lot of people who wouldn't have survived in hardier times are, are, are now surviving and they now have the power to get into institutions you have people who are less capable have a less um, intrinsic ability or less uh, less over less lesser genetic stock uh, I know it's a really hard thing to say, but maybe they aren't ones to carry on or to um, assume the responsibility of conforming to higher ideals or giving up their life for, for a nation. And I, I think that in a way you're kind of seeing a bit of a natural correction in the fact that they don't have high fertility rates a lot of the time. It's it's the it's the sort of the weaker feminine liberal bugman from the coast that doesn't have the kids. It's the overweight, um, ugly feminist who doesn't tend to have kids. And it's just it's just an observation of mine. And it, it, it's been like three four hundred years ever since we've had these values uh, coming into the forefront. I mean, this is the crystallization of of um, sixteen generations worth of bad ideas plus a, um, a new kind of person coming into the fray and being able to impose their worldview upon others. Yeah, I'd say that, um, I guess just in closing, I, I do think that while I am very opposed to many of the ideas of the Enlightenment and the ideas of liberalism, and I've made that clear on my channel many times, uh, I think that um, it is, and this is kind of going to be, uh, I guess, a preview of my next video. I, th I think that we can't only blame it on just bad ideas being in, uh, being kind of released upon us. But I do think it is kind of a lot. It ha does have a, have a lot to do with modernity, and it has a lot to do with kind of uh, just man and society getting a lot weaker through you know uh, all this material wealth and, like you had said, possibly even like uh, dysgenic. Uh, um, population trends. Uh, Edward Dutton talks a lot about that. So if anyone is interested in that, you should definitely check out his channel. But um, I think a lot of that does have to do with kind of the human aspect of people just kind of becoming weaker. And um, I, I, and that's why I think like, you know, a lot of things pe people should focus on if, if it kind of just seems something so huge, uh, you definitely can. Uh, yeah. The best ways for, for an individual to go about this is, and I'm not, I'm not going to be like Jordan Peterson and say, you know, clean your room, focus on yourself only, but it do, it is very important for you to realize that, you know, to, to actually pull us out of this, you, we do really have to kind of uh, try to buck the trend of uh, modernity and ha we do really have to try to uh, reject a lot of these negative influences ourselves because, you know, I don't think that, um, I don't think that there's going to be like a, a political solution tomorrow that kind of just uh, completely reverses that trend because a lot of that is has to do with um, just the lifestyle that we're living today. And I think that that's something that needs to change before um, there's going to be a wide societal change. That's, that's my opinion on that. Anyway, um, we've been going for about an hour and a half. Uh, anything left to say or well? 
no, no. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come on, Endeavor. I really enjoyed the stream, and um, yeah, look out for the the book on my Twitter, Facebook, or Gab, and I will probably stream about it as well on my YouTube channel, which is just all well good. And yeah, th th that's about it. Thank you very much for having me. No problem. And uh, so you said that it's coming out June first, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's already out for pre-order. Okay, um, uh, but. The, the uh, send me the link to the pre-order and I'll post it at the bottom of this stream. So every, anyone that's interested in checking out that book, uh, I'll post the link at the bottom of the stream after we're done here and you can go check that out. Um, hit the upvote if you enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for listening. I'll talk to you all later.